what I want to tell you today is about auto testing in Python and how, in my opinion, it should be held and done. Today's agenda is I'll briefly talk about test parameter in Python, about acceptance tests, behavior driven testing, and behavior driven development, just a bit. Also about system and integration tests and difficulties we can uh, face when we're doing some complicated testing using multiple system parts and uh, crossing the boundaries in our system. And also I'll show some practical examples using PyTest and a few other nice libraries. So let's see how it works. Uh, I don't want to talk a lot about importance of testing Pyramid in Python because I think all of you are pretty good enough about uh, how important is test-driven development, how important it is to deliver high quality products without any bugs and issues. And because test cycle and developer's time is expensive enough, so it would be much better if you produce code without any bugs always, 100% of our time. Unfortunately, it's impossible, so we should write tests and should uh, increase our code test coverage. And we should feel confident about our code and about test writing and about what we're actually doing with our software. Okay. One of the... Uh, Okay, uh, test parameter. Uh, it's not almost not the same as it's shown in a very important article of Martin Fowler about test parameter and testing in general. There were three parts in those articles, but also I found lots of uh, parameters which contain four parts. Uh, the first one is the highest level of the parameter is enter and tests. Uh, this test uh, testing the whole software, the whole software product from beginning to the end uh, to be sure and to be sure that your product behaves as expected and be sure that your product will deliver uh, what is what should be delivered, what is the acceptance criteria for your product, what is the actual business value of, of your product. Of course, this uh, end-to-end -end test uh, don't cover uh, most parts of your product. Mostly it's about happy pass, and usually test coverage is about a few percent, no more. But the pass rate should be close to, to be 100%, because that's the actual business value of your product. So you should bring the value to the business. The next level is system testing. Uh, you also could find that system tests uh, kind of defined as something standing apart of the test pyramid. I just thought it would be useful to keep it inside. Just don't forget about them. Usually it's testing which is conducted on some integration of your system parts and uh, system which your system you write, which and how it is integrated with other systems. Maybe some external APIs, maybe some other completely third party vendors which produce data for you or give some value for your product and you have to rely on them. So it also it, the system testing should also have a quite high pass rate, lower than end to end, but still quite high. And another interesting stuff about system testing is that it's not only functional testing, while end to end is mostly mainly focused on functional tests. But system testing should also contain some non-functional requirements testing, probably performance tests, whatever. So it usually has about from 20 to 40 percentage of coverage and high pass rate too. Another two parts of this pyramid is integration testing and unit testing. We all are familiar with them. That's how the test we're mostly writing in our court, in our development cycle. Integration tests are about Actually, it's about any part of your code that crosses the boundary of your models. Whenever some model calls another model, some package uh, gets some data using uh, some model from another package, you should treat those code and those behaviors integration testing if your test covers that case. So it should be necessary that this uh, integration testing have quite high pass rate, close to be 100%. But test coverage also more than a system testing, but not close to 100%. It's about 60 to 80, probably. And the last one, it's the bottom of our test pyramid, unit testing. That's kind of testing of minimal code units. You probably could test so close uh, to be the minimum as possible. 
uh, all unit testing should be uh, concentrated, focused on testing only certain model without evolving any other models. So you should uh, make some efforts to make this happen because usually it's quite complicated to decouple your code enough so you could do this unit testing. Of course, using Python, you can uh, you, you can use some monkey patching uh, just to make unit tests uh, without evolving other units, uh, other models, and don't cross the boundary. But probably it's not the best case. So from all those four, unit tests uh, bring some requirements to your system from the architecture perspective. You can't just can't easily make a high level of test coverage with unit tests without making some effort about decoupling of your system and make all your models as most independent as it's possible. So it's kind of a tricky thing a bit from another case, from another perspective. Uh, let's focus on acceptance tests. Usually acceptance tests uh, are focused on certain requirements for your software, on specification, on contracts. All acceptance tests is a part of end-to-end -end tests, and they are focused on a user paths, on a business values that your software brings. So it's usually very high level stuff, very high level tests, which uh, if you wanted to run it on your local stack, you should deploy everything related to your system. Database, all external APIs, whatever is going to be used on the real product you should use too when you run acceptance tests, or at least as close as possible to be sure that uh, you have the same working system as will run in, prod in production or on your user's machines. It depends on how your product is deployed. Okay, so mostly when we write some stories and start implementing them, it's a nice behavior. It's really good when your story contains some acceptance criteria, And if acceptance criteria are written down in a story, the first thing that developers should do, it's my opinion, but probably you'll agree with it, you should write acceptance test for your story. Uh, at this point, this acceptance test should be used by you as developer, just to verify that you are ready, that you are done, that this story is actually implemented. Because as soon as your acceptance test pass with success, with green, you can be sure that that's enough, that you have done what is, was actually required by business. So it can be acceptance test focused on functional requirements. It's very close to the management. It's very close to working about certain features, feature requirements, uh, kind of request change, it depends on how it's your management on your product goes. So while writing acceptance test, you should keep in mind several points. One of them, quite important from my side, is uh, two principles, Yagni and KISS. One of them, which is called about Yagni, uh, you aren't going to need it. Because uh, when you try to write acceptance test for a story, you usually tend to think about your story like, uh, adding more value for code you are writing down than it was required. Just usual example, you're writing some login form. You have an acceptance criteria that user should be able to login to, to the whole system uh, using his login uh, kind of username and probably a password. But there's nothing told, nothing said in the story about should this username be unique? Should it contain some special characters, symbols, spaces, dashes, whatever? As a developer, you tend to be a bit biased. You're writing this form. You're probably thinking, okay, let's add some more checks. That login is username is unique. That uh, it doesn't contain space, as an example, in his username. But that's not what was required from business. Probably this uh, decision you are making by your own at this point will be changed. Mostly it is unexpected from the business perspective when you implement it. So you shouldn't do that actually. That's why your acceptance criteria should be quite nice defined without any BS in it. And as soon as you write an acceptance test following those accept acceptance criteria, uh, you should implement it as is without any additional value that you probably think could be necessary, but usually it's not. So 
uh, that's the first bullet point about acceptance test. Another one, um, usually acceptance tests define functional requirements for the product. It means that it doesn't, acceptance tests shouldn't take care about any edge cases or corner cases. It shouldn't take care about some non-trivial user pass. Usually it should be focused only on the certain uh, business need, business values that your product brings. So it should be focused on a happy pass. It should be focused on a simple feature implementation without any additional requirements as it could be done and could be met with this acceptance test. Actually, all other bullet points are uh, going from, from the first one about Yagni and Keys. Keep it simple and you aren't gonna need it if it's not required in a de defined from business way. Another interesting case when you use end-to-end -end tests is end-to-end uh, -to -end tests related to the troubleshooting or some kind of bug bashing. When you have a certain bug, usually we don't write bugs uh, like with a, with a plan. You don't have a plan to write bugs. <laughs> usually it happens because you don't expect it. Usually it happens not because there is some kind of business requirement which was changed and it's treated as a bug. Bug is something when your system behaves not as is expected. And as far as it's not expected, it's also not expected by a developer. And uh, in most cases, you don't have clear understanding where is the root cause of your bug. Of your bug. If you had, usually you could avoid that bug on the way you were writing your code, on the way you were implementing the feature, which is buggy. So it's something you don't expect. In most cases, developers tend to dig into the code as soon as they start uh, uh, looking for a bug and looking for root cause. You start doing some kind of uh, debugging, looking in code, where does it come from? You think it will be the fastest way uh, to fix it. In most cases, it is not. In most cases, you should write acceptance test for the bug, which is an end-to-end -end level test in most cases. Well, in most cases, you are not sure where does this bug comes from. So the first step is kind of a produced bug on your end-to-end -end level test. Then probably this step may be avoided if you're quite clear about where does it comes from. And you could start certainly from the second step, which is reducing the area of interest while writing an integration test. When you know some kind of uh, several modules or packages where the bugs come from, some interfaces that probably working not properly or doesn't follow the spec in some corner case. So you are creating some integration tests to reduce the area of interest where the bug can be. Then uh, using these integration tests, you're quite close to the actual root cause. You should write a unit test, which is a certain uh, code which is buggy after you wrote a successfully unit test that reproduce the bug root cause you can fix it that's uh, actually the fastest way you could apply the fix to your system next step quite clear you should verify that your fix really helps on all levels from unit test to end-to-end -end test the last step uh, which is the most controversial from all of those but it's really important from my opinion. It's a cleanup. It's an interesting case when you're troubleshooting your bugs using end-to-end -end, end -end or integration level tests that uh, after you finished with bug fixing, you have several tests that actually doing the same. They were written with the same purpose to find where the bug comes from. They were written with the same purposes to identify uh, that the bug is actually fixed. So you have several uh, functions, test cases, models, which doing the same thing, which are sitting in your test suite. That's kind of uh, introducing duplication of logic in your system. So I would really suggest you to avoid this duplication and to remove those tests which are not necessary and those tests that are duplicating your actual functionality check. And I would start from removing end-to-end -end tests because all of this end-to-end -end integration tests while you was looking for the root cause are kind of scaffolding. It was necessary for you to find where does this bug comes from. It was necessary for you to be sure 100% that the bug is fixed with your tiny change in some module, but definitely 
not what is the business requirement. It doesn't look like to be an acceptance criteria for your system or any kind of acceptance test. So in most cases, you aren't going to need it. And in case it's really useful and needed, it's more like it's not a bug. It was a business requirement to change some rule, to change how the system behaves. So probably it's not the case of troubleshooting. So I would suggest you to remove everything except the latest one, the last one unit test you have created, uh, which is the most close to the code as possible from this perspective. Uh, when you write in acceptance tests, you quite soon uh, will see how complicated the, all of those tests are. It's not easy to write a test for some feature which involves lots of other features to be used while you come to that feature. You tell in the user story like user logins, user does some stuff, user adds some another stuff, and now you come to the feature you want to implement. So your acceptance test will evolve lots and lots of fixtures, or any way you could do it. it. Anyway, lots of steps should be done before you will actually test the feature you're going to work on now. That's why usually those acceptance tests are complicated and tend to be even more complicated as system evolves. Behavior-driven testing, uh, alongside with behavior-driven development, really helps you with this complication of your test suite. So usually it looks like kind of business analytic, it can be product owner from in some teams, whatever, writes a formal user story. Almost the same you can see in Jira or whatever you use. Then some kind of testers or a close to be a tester team guy writes a scenario based on those user story. This scenario is much more formalized, but it's still human readable. It still looks like a story. It looks like more someone tells you a certain story in a natural language. Then those scenarios getting to be verified by the business team, by the product owner, business analyst, whatever. To be sure that the actual close, about one step closer to the code, one step uh, far from the business story, that it's still right, those uh, test scenario is valid. Probably uh, the same story may cause several scenarios in it. That's why it's, the step is usually necessary too. Then automation engineer applies uh, step definitions and writes those step scenarios actually doing it in your code or in a separate project that will be used later for test automation. Anyways, it's kind of implementing the test scenario in code, and that's which is the most close to the code uh, in this behavior-driven testing. All those scenarios are going to be automated and used as a regression testing, or used as acceptance criteria for your story, you could also rely on them while you're developing a new feature. You could uh, trigger them to be sure you've done it, or maybe something is still wrong. You can also trigger those scenarios to verify that your system works as expected from the business uh, perspective, because probably you misunderstood some business needs, some story, or maybe there is some controversial requirements in the amount of business stories and business needs, which is also tricky to define uh, as easy. So you really need those behavior tests, which should be implemented, which should be written down somehow and automated. In this place, which is uh, a bit unexpected from, with, actually what is the difference between behavior-driven testing and behavior-driven development? As a developer, you, you lose control over your test suite at this point. Whenever you use behavior-driven development or behavior-driven testing, the actual story scenario is not is out of your control. It comes somewhere from outside of your actual development team. It's a business analyst or a product owner, whatever. So it's kind of out of your control a bit, but it's still close to what you are working on. So you should take in a, you, you should look on it. You should uh, feel free to suggest some improvements in those uh, behavior driven testing scenarios. Anyway, whenever you approach it, you are using, you need to be able to use some framework to make this easier and uh, to make it easier for your uh, business analyst, product owners, work with, those, work with those stories and verify they are what they really need. So there are some uh, benefits using behavior-driven testing. It's kind of simple notations that non-tech staff can use for write stories. 
that's kind of user path which is explained that's kind of a good choice when your product is complicated and tends to be more complicated with time it gives you some way to work with your business analyst and uh, QA and product owner quite close using the same actually files text files where your business stories are written down which are used later for testing and regression testing and of course it's uh, regression testing which helps to define that your product is a high quality product without bugs or at least all business value is which is brought by your product is really brought without any buggy stuff inside but using python we have only three probably there are some more i found at least three which is popular and actively evolving plugins and frameworks to implement those behavior driven development or behavior driven testing so those three are behave which is quite close uh, to one of implemented in probably java i'm not sure where does it come from anyway it was the first one uh, which is which comes to python uh, which has to python packages all of those three using Gherkin, Behave also uses Gherkin, it, it's based on it. You also have uh, Behave Parallel, which gives the ability to write these behavior tests in parallel. Uh, it has quite nice integration with Flask and Django, popular frameworks. It is nicely documented. There are lots of examples, use cases. It's really nice documentation. Maybe some reuse of steps you need to when you run tests is over complicated a bit probably but i would say it's not over complicated it's kind of not it's implemented not in a pythonic way so you would feel uncomfortable with it while you're starting using this framework another one which is my personal favorite and i would suggest you use it is pytest bdd plugin for a pytest it also used Gherkin. Uh, Gherkin must say it's kind of notation. It looks very similar to natural English language, but it's a bit formalized. You have to use keywords to run those tests. Test steps uh, have certain names. Test steps are chained together with a certain words like and, after, before, then, else, and so on. Uh, but uh, when you write, uh, when you write it, it's not so easy. But when you read it, it looks very natural. You really understand what's going on if even if you have never seen this Gherkin before. So about PyTest PDD, it's 100% uh, compatible with PyTest and all PyTest plugins. So it uses fixtures, it uses the same uh, plugins you use with PyTest. You can easily integrate everything in it. So it makes easier to run as this uh, framework, easier to use BDD in Python when using this plugin. But unfortunately, it's mostly the same with all by tests. It has some magic, like special naming convention for test steps, special naming convention for Gherkin files, special, special naming convention, and special uh, folder naming. So it's not a Pythonic way of doing things. It's kind of implicit a bit. Uh, maybe you don't expect it somehow. But as soon as you go, as soon as you're used to it, it, it looks nice and goes smoothly. Another one, if you use Nose, which is oh, which is actually a nice framework too for testing, you could use a lawyer plugin for Nose. It does almost the same. It uses Gherkin. It's more explicit, uh, compatible to PyTest. Uh, it's good enough. There are less stars on GitHub for those plugin and Nose itself. But you can use it if you use Nose on your project. The next step about our testing pyramid is system test. It's a really complicated and separate uh, separate thing, separate beast. I won't be focusing it too much. Uh, from my personal perspective, system tests in Python is mostly about some kind of performance tests and load testing. When you make some synthetic load for your application, just to verify it works as you expect. Maybe you use the same load testing to identify some bottlenecks in your application performance, which is the same as performance test, actually. So in most cases, this performance test leave elsewhere. They're not a part of your regular test suite, and you use, them, you use it from time to time. Uh, I would also add some uh, additional checks like um, probably code complexity check, 
maybe like uh, following some style uh, style guides for your code, some code quality checks, or any additional check you want to add to your product. Uh, it looks like a system test because it focused mostly on non-functional requirements, which is the only place in this pyramid is a system test for any non-functional requirements. And usually it's not what, it's kind of what clients expect from your application, but it's not that could be easily defined and easily verified. When some functional requirement could be easily defined in test, the application does require thing or not, but about performance, it's not so easy to verify if it's really what you're going, what you're expecting from your application. So from my perspective, the system test stepping a bit aside and has a special case in the whole test pyramid. While integration tests, it's what we as a developers are used to work with. That's the thing we usually work with most, uh, mostly when we are writing some tests in Python. Uh, honestly speaking, integration tests, any test that crosses the boundary between models should be treated as, in, treated as integration. But from practical and from personal experience, I would say, usually you call integration tests when your code crosses the boundary of your application. In most cases, it's some kind of storage. You're doing some query to your storage, you store something and you're going to verify, was your object stored? Could you get the, some object from your storage by the query you have built just to verify it works as expected and it works fine? Uh, that's an integration test. You also call integration test when your system makes some call to external API, or maybe not an external, but an API of another component, which is a part of your system. That part may be deployed independently or it's kind of dependent deployment. In any case, you would call this integration testing. We could treat it as a system test, to be honest, but I would say we usually use it everything together in one title. That's so just an integration test. You're crossing the boundary of your application. Uh, again, honestly speaking, integration test is about crossing the boundary of modules or packages. So whenever I write some interface in package A, which is used by some code from package B, and you write the test that you follow the spec of those interface, you actually do it in the right way, you should call it as an integration test. Why? Because you actually can write a test and make some mock, make some patch uh, for the code you are working with to identify the test call is working as expected and interface is following the spec. Or maybe not, it depends. In most cases, it's about crossing the boundary on the system. Okay. The major, I say difficulties, but I could also say drawbacks of writing integration tests. I would say usually we have three problems. They are somehow chained together. Like your test suite tends to increase constantly because your system complexity tends to, to increase constantly. And you tend to add new features to your system constantly. That's why test suite grows. Uh, you can uh, somehow solve it or at least somehow manage this complexity. Testing on the end-to-end -end level only happy pass using BDD, using uh, behavior, behavior driven development or any of those techniques that makes your life easier and makes those stuff at least somehow manageable and reducing complexity as, as more as you can. Because your test suite tends to increase constantly and your application tends to be more complex, performance of your test suite usually decreases and this decrease comes more and more with time. So you have to manage this low performance of your test suite because test suite is something that is really useful for development process. And it's really useful to run test suite as soon as you introduce any change in any place in your code. It would be really great if you could run the whole test suite with all integration end to end and system test whenever you change any symbol of your code. Usually it's not possible. Usually it uh, runs quite slow and you don't do that, but it would be nice if you could. So you could verify that you're writing code that doesn't break anything. And if it does, you could uh, quite soon verify that it does. So low performance, it could be managed. 
the first step, you're writing happy pass test, you're using BDD, you're improving your application, uh, improving test suite complexity, which will increase uh, performance. But you could also run tests in parallel. You could use some kind of seed data uh, just to avoid doing a step, bringing uh, multiple steps that are necessary to bring your application to a certain step where, where are you doing your test. It's kind of application snapshot at this point. So you could run one call to your probably database storage. You add all necessary data for your test, which you're going to run now. Then you run your test. Then you swipe everything out to do whatever you want with your storage. Anyway, it will be a bit faster than introducing lots of step, like registering a user, adding user account, more, 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 doing it step by step. You could instead write a seed data and introduce it in your database with one shot. That may increase performance. And the most, uh, and the biggest, and the most uh, complex problem which you will face writing end to end test is making your tests dependent on each other. That's the most problem with testing in Python and not only Python, testing any application. From my perspective, usually tests became uh, dependent on each other they became coupled with the storage. All your systems use the same storage or close to be the same, and uh, your tests became uh, coupled through that storage. You can manage it. You can improve your tests, your architecture. You can improve how you run your tests, like your tests should uh, rely on unique data, unique rows in your database, or any technique which you could imagine. But anyway, that's most problem. That's the most complicated problem to manage is uh, dependency for of tests. We have several ways to solve this dependency and make storage decoupling. The first one, which is uh, probably the easiest one, is clean storage uh, for each test. Kind of truncate all database tables, remove everything which uh, exists in your storage. You make uh, probably a dump of your database, which you will restore after each test. This is the easiest one to implement. You will get the really strict reproducible environment. You can be 100% sure that it is reproducible. You could be 100% sure that you don't care about any artifacts remaining in your storage after the test run. But you couldn't run your test suite on tests in parallel because of that, because you will swipe out the database from one test while another one trying to do something with this database. So it's just impossible to run test, tests in parallel. In most cases, this approach is rather, small, is rather slow because all those truncated tables take some time. Usually databases do some additional checks of relationships in your table. So it could, it could be really slow because of that. And usually this uh, slowness causes, uh, caused by high resource consumption. You do lots of calls, you do some lots of stuff under the hood while swiping the data from your storage. But this is an easiest one solution. Another one is to clean test data after the test. It's kind of a bit more complicated than the previous one example. Uh, this one is resource efficient because you don't have to do all those relation ID checks for all tables you have, for all storage you have, but it also has its drawbacks. It complicates, it complicates not only test fix stores, but the whole test suite. You have to keep in mind that you should, after you add in any fix store, you should clean this up afterwards. You should run your test suite in parallel, which is nice, but still it can be coupled. As an example, if you do some uh, aggregation ag against your database and running tests in parallel, we'll face this coupling. As an example, you probably have table with users and you have like, some kind of check how many users are in a system. If you wanted to test the functions that does this stuff and do it in parallel with any other test which also need to create a user in your table, you will face uh, some issues with this test you will see that you created five tests in your table and you expect to get five ropes when you call for a count, but you'll get six sometimes when other tests also created a user, a user for, for him. So it may be coupled, keep in mind that. And another, probably the most uh, important and the most impacting problem with this cleaning uh, test is uh, artifacts. 
sometimes you don't expect those artifacts. Sometimes you could just uh, forget about them. But if your function that is under the test, it's what you are going to test, creates some additional data in your storage, you should just wipe out those data after test two, and you can forget about that. So you will face some artifacts in your tables, some artifacts in your storage. Probably it's not expect, it's something you don't expect. And those artifacts could possibly also uh, impact another test. That's why cleaning tests after each run also doesn't solve the problem of decoupling 100%. You have to keep it in mind and you have to be accurate with it. Another one technique is uh, separating storage per test. Using Docker or any other virtual, virtual environment, virtual storage, you could create a separate storage for each test. That's probably also so straightforward and 100% uh, working solution that decouples your tests 100% uh, as the first one. You will be able to run your tests in parallel. This problem is solved. It's quite easy to implement. You can use some Docker, you can use Docker API, you can use any other virtual techniques that will create a separate storage for each test, but you'll face high resource consumption for sure. You won't be able to avoid it because every test, every test is running in your system now while you're running those, will require to create a separate uh, storage and also apply all necessary steps to make this storage uh, actually working with your code, like applying migrations or whatever. And because of that, because of high resource consumption in most, in most cases, such approach is rather slow. So keep in mind, if your tests are somehow coupled or if you can decouple them for 100%, this technique is probably suitable for you. Another technique which can be used is a storage level transactions. Some storage, some storages, some storage techniques could give you an ability to have a transaction which actually doesn't apply any change you are going to introduce to the storage until you will explicitly say the transaction is done, please commit those changes. But uh, while, while you are inside of transaction, from the perspective of your code, uh, all data, all changes are already applied. So you would see queries are running, like the data are already uh, in place, but those changes are not applied. This is resource efficient technique. It's uh, one of the fastest you can imagine in all those five. You will be able to run your test suite in parallel. Every test uh, became independent, uh, but not every storage has such feature. Postgres as an example has, uh, SQLite as an example doesn't. Uh, and to be honestly, you won't be testing exact the same code because the code which is responsible for those sessions uh, should be somehow monkey patched, or at least you won't be so easy to use transactions when those transactions uh, should be used by your business logic code. When you want to use transaction because it's required by business and you use transactions me mechanics uh, in your tests, they start interacting somehow, probably in an unexpected way. So this technique has also its drawbacks. Another one, which I mentioned, is uh, seeding data and snapshot. Uh, honestly speaking, it's one of the easiest to implement. You can just add data for each test uh, whenever you want, uh, but it has a huge drawback. You have to maintain those data. If you insert and seed data, for each test in a separate, you have the same problems and the same drawbacks as cleaning test data after each test or before. So it's rather slow. You have to do data maintenance and probably you won't be able to run it in parallel. Or at least you have to somehow mix this technique with some other like a separate storage per test. So it can be used, but keep in mind about the drawbacks for this technique. I don't see any silver bullet while you're writing uh, tests in Python or any other language because storage decoupling is a huge problem which is not solved on 100% nowadays. So you will, you, you still will face some issues with it. Okay, uh, I think that's it from the perspective of presentation I wanna show you. And I'm going to focus on code right now. 
So what I wanted to show you, that's kind of a dummy product, uh, dummy project. Uh, just a second, I'll hide everything unnecessary. Uh, let's start from what I writing, what as a project I'm going to show you, and what are the actual examples of code I wanted to show you and share with you. We have really simple book storage, which has only author and book. That's kind of two tables in our database. It's rather simple. Uh, some metadata engine. I use uh, I use Postgres as quite common technique nowadays for relational database management storage. Sorry. Anyway, so we have author, author we have book, we have some uh, session mechanics which use Postgres. We have session maker just to be sure we are in the same context. Let's focus on some business value we are having. I've created a simple module named core when all our code that does some useful stuff leaves. So the first function I'm going to introduce is publish a book. Quite easy way. We have an author ID, so probably we should have an author in our database by this time. We add in some title and we're also using some certain session to keep in mind that that's kind of one transaction or at least one session. To, to be able to change this business steps somewhere else. It's rather simple. I don't think I have to explain you all those lines. We're just creating a book and inserting it in our database and returning its book ID. So um, keep in mind that when the function is named like publish a book, it looks like this function has a business value. This function is kind of a core of our product. But at this point, you may see that this function definitely knows about the actual technology we use for our storage. So this function is uh, written down around the storage. This, fun this function knows exact technology which is used to persist our data. I would say this approach is rather wrong from perspective of your code architecture. And the reason why it's wrong is because you can't test this function using a unit test. It's impossible because every line of the code in this function somehow crosses the boundary of your application. It goes to the database or interacts somehow with the database under the hood. You won't be able to write a unit test for that. Uh, keep in mind it. So it's but but in most cases you you face lots of such like, such things while you're working on any project when uh, actual business logic knows about storage technology, which is used to persist data. So we can test this only using integration tests. We have to cross the boundary. My project has a test package, which is, has integration sub package and the different techniques of testing the same published book function live here. So one of the easiest way of testing this function is using no cleanup, running this function as is, storing some messy data in our database, don't do any cleaning, leave as is. To do that, I will create the first step is a session fixture. Uh, actually, at this point, you can avoid it, but you will see that it's uh, rather useful. Uh, as far as this function public book needs some uh, author already, already persisted in our database, you have to pass some author ID. So I cr created another fixture about author. I hope you all are familiar with the PyTest and PyTest fixtures techniques. So every time, uh, keep in mind, this is some kind of PyTest magic, which I don't like. When I run my test function, I pass an argument named author and Py PyTest expects that somewhere in our project, there is a fixture called author. This fixture will be called and its output will be given, will be passed here as an argument. So. When I run this test published book, I run the author fixture, which creates my author, persists in our database, returns it as is, so I can use ID. Uh, also keep in mind and take a look on this line. I created a title for my book and it should be unique. I use UID4 function as the easiest way to make this function unique, but you could use any other. There are lots of... Uh, different uh, techniques, approach, kind of random. There is a fake package in Python, whatever, to create a fake and useful data for your tests. This one is good enough because I'm pretty sure almost 100% the title 
on uh, each run will be unique and won't interact or, or actually my database won't be the book with the same title. This will be useful, but I'll show it just uh, in a minute why. So I got this book ID while running my published book. And afterwards, I also run one of my business uh, functions, get book, which is the second one, uh, which gets book from my storage. I could also do the check, like uh, verifying that this book persists in our database in a different way using some other function, helper function in my test suite. But in this case, I think it's reasonable to use the same function to get this done and checking the title is the same. So running this test, it passed successfully, hopefully. That's nice. Uh, I'm taking a look in my author table. You can see I oh, had a couple of times run this test again. So ID is 103. And first name was created. There is a random name, last name. In the same way created, there is a random name. Why it's random lines, random numbers? Because the way I created this first name and last name. Usually it's really useful for you to create uh, random names for each for each for each fixture for each for each test run, just to be able to verify that your test doesn't interact with data that were created and added in your storage somehow before, maybe some junk data that already persists in your database. And also about my book, uh, here is it. It's stored. It has also a link, so it works. Test passed successfully. This technique is rather easy. You can use it in case you run your test suite against clean database and you don't care if anything uh, remains in those database. When project is rather small, when project is well architectured, when your test suite is well architectured, I think you could keep it as is. You don't need to do some cleanup. This test run will be the fastest one among all you see in this presentation later. Uh, it's quite suitable if you don't care about the data leaving your data in your database. But sometimes you care. Uh, mostly when you're developing on your own machine, your own kind of local stack, some seed data which remain in your database, some junk data may be messy. You may misunderstand what's going on in your system. So cleanup in most cases is really useful and helpful. Okay, so what can we do if I want to do some cleanup of my test data in my database? Almost the same, but you would see I added this change. Let's split it right so you could verify what changed in between. When I edit my author, I just return it. When I want to, oh, sorry. When I want to do some cleanup, I can yield this also fixture and all calls afterwards will be called after the tests uh, after the test is actually done more of that those calls will be introduced whenever test pass successfully or not so also fixture will be removed from my database in any case if test passed successfully or if it goes wrong anyway but what also complicated i have only 30 lines of code here and this test suite is uh, half more, 45, almost 50. So what's also changed? I have to do a cleanup of my book, which is inserted in my database with this published book call. That was uh, what I told you about this uh, problems of cleaning up my published book, which is a business, business function, which does some useful stuff from the business perspective, remains some data in database. Something persists in my storage because of, because of this call. So, so in my test suite, I have to do this cleanup. I can do it using a cleanup fixture. I wrote it down here. It yields nothing because I don't care. It shouldn't be nothing. But in any case, after test is done, I should run this delete operation, which removes this book from my database and removes the exact book, which is done by title, while title comes from another fixture. It should be also unique, maybe helpful. Anyway, you can hard code it if you want, but I wouldn't suggest you to do so. So this test relies on uh, use fixture book cleanup. I could also pass this book cleanup here. Uh, so by test, we'll use it. 
but it's kind of passing an argument which is not used inside of the test function. So I would better suggest you to use this uh, such kind of declaration. Anyway, this test should also successfully pass. It's run, all done. You could verify that my author table has the same author. My book table also didn't change anyway, but test successfully passed. To verify that actually some data were added, I could run some kind of debugging of my test and verify what's going on uh, when test fixtures didn't do any cleanup, any teardown fixtures were called, but um, test, test is running. So you could see there is a test author and there is a test book, here it is. But then I'll finish my test and I've cleaned for myself. This technique is really useful. I would say it's probably the best you can use. It is almost always suitable, but keep in mind about the drawbacks I told you before, like uh, leaving some data. Uh, you could clearly see that the fixture is rather complicated. You can reuse those fixtures, but keep in mind, it's not so easy to do that stuff. So you can use this technique if you want, and I would suggest you to do it. Another useful technique about cleaning up is a total cleanup, which was the first one I told you, which is the easiest one to implement. As you can see, fixtures with total cleanup remain the same. No line of code is changed. The check also remains the same. It does completely the same. The only change introduced here is this session fixture does a total swipe out of my database. I get all books, all authors, and delete them explicitly. Then I return my session and also do the cleanup afterwards, my test done. Using such technique, I won't be able to run tests in parallel because I could probably swipe out the data, some seed data, some fixtures for another test while the test is starting or finishing. Anyway, that's also a useful approach. You can run this fixture test passes, everything goes right. When you check your table of authors, it's empty. And the same with the database about books. You don't have anything in your table because of this total swipe out. If I'll stop inside of the test, definitely I will see that there are some data that are created by my fixtures. They persisted here. I can use them, I can see them but they will be removed as soon as test fail, as uh, test is finished. Just to verify that uh, test uh, fixtures, cleanup fixtures will be called, I would make this test fail because of this fake assertion. You would see the test failed on this line of assert false. It's okay, it's expected. And nothing in my database persisted. All fixtures worked fine because of that. So. That's an option for you, you can use it also. As you can see, if you have two tables, you do this two queries and another two. You can actually use only one of them. You can either do the cleanup before a test or the cleanup afterwards, it depends, or you can use both. Anyway, you have to do this job and you have to do it manually. When the project is rather simple and small, it's just a few calls for a few tables. When there are about 30 tables in your project, I don't think it's an easy one to do, to do such thing. More of that, your data and your tables could be titled with relationships, and you have to keep in mind that the order of applying, deleting your data uh, matters. You can't easily, you just can't delete the data when you have some relationship to that rows from another table. So you should also take an eye how it works and keep it in mind. But from all the other step, uh, steps, this, is, this approach is the easiest one because this fixture of session is the only place where some complexity introduced. All other fixtures remain quite simple. Add some data, run your test, check that it's uh, data on your database or taken by query from those. So it works fine. What I also wanted to show you is using Mixer. That's a cool uh, Python tool. Uh, I, if, as far as I remember, it's kind of in beta for now, so it's not stabilized on 100%. Uh, 
but this mixer has several ASM tools, have some techniques you could use and make your test suite a bit easier to write and much more easier to understand. So what is Mixer does? Mixer is able to create seed data or create fixture data in your database. Mixer is able to find all relationships for uh, tables in your database and create dependent tables. At this point, I will focus on uh, this uh, get book exist function, which could be found in core, which gets some book from a table. This function only gets book. You have seen it before. To check this function, I have to persist some book in my storage. But book has a relationship to an author. So I have to create an author too to be able to check this function. So what should I do here? I call the book. I assert if it's not none, uh, rather simple. I use my book fix store. If I use uh, the same technique as for uh, avoiding mixer, at this point, I have to create uh, also a row in my database with author. But see what uh, mixer gives, gives you, how ability it gives you. Mixer is able to verify that book table has relationship to an author and also create an author for you. It will do it automatically, and you just don't have to keep in mind all those relationships. So it works when you, in your models, define these relationships explicitly. If you just leave author ID, it won't help you. But if you define it, this relationship explicitly, Mixer will be able to verify that, oh, yeah, I see this relation. I will create dependent uh, row in some other table or query it. You can control it. Anyway, this really helps you. When you have easy fixed store like this one for a book, just one step should be added, creating an author for that book. Uh, it looks like overcomplicated using some kind of external package with Mixer, defining what does this blend API and so on. But when you have uh, more complicated queries, when lots of dependencies are involved, it may be really useful for you. So just a few words about Mixer fixed tour. I'm just creating a special Mixer object. This special mixer object keeps in mind and it uh, takes an eye of all your database relationships, tables, and so on, just to be able to make this magic of creating dependent objects. So let's run this test. It passed. It passed easily. Let's stop somewhere under the hood. Oh. Interesting stuff. Uh, here we use Osorfix tool which creates an author by this one mixture, which is blended. I can say last name, fake. I can fill first name, fake. Let's also see how it look, works. Let's go to our database and verify. So when I fake data for my author, you can see it's not a UID strings. It's faked kind of really close to be some strings or names or whatever. I could also fake my title which is one probably tested, or this one, which was faked by Mixer. Anyway, it uses. These data are here. You can use it. You can verify in my debugging tools that this book ID, which is used in my test, here is it. It relies on author ID. Yeah, I can take a look. Yeah, that's true. It's on Brie and Leon. So that's it in here. This is helpful, but... Uh, it doesn't show you everything and the most powerful parts of this mixer. I will uncomment this line, which does only faking of my book title. But I will also do this kind of thing. I can fake my author first name as an example. So at this point, I could probably book test book exist, which is use only book. It passed successfully. When I run debugging, oh, stop. I need to stop here inside. Yeah, that's my book. That's my author object, 112. And you see that the name of my author is Bob. It's the same as I verified it here in my mixer fix tool. You could also see that I never used in this test book exist uh, test the exact author fix tool. 
I didn't ask to create this fixture. I didn't ask to do it explicitly. But Mixer was able to identify that author is needed because of relationship. And also Mixer did it, did it, uh, did creation of author uh, under the hood by me. There is some kind of a bit weird uh, convention that author attribute in my book table, its attribute of author first name should be separated with two dashes. It's also relatively uh, unexpected, but it's kind of uh, where you should just learn and remember if you want to use this package. Anyway, you could create this line, create uh, all necessary fixtures, also create automatically. So this will dramatically reduce the complexity of your test suite, especially reduce the complexity of writing fixtures. You, it will be useful for you to use this tooling. I really suggest you. About the actual mixer abilities, it uses Blend to do this magic of creating uh, some stuff in your database or whatever. Mixer also works with uh, MongoDB probably and some other storage techniques, but not too much. I don't expect it works with Redis probably. And probably DynamoDB also is not on the, on the way of the Mixer tool. Anyway, this is what I told you about Mixer. And the next interesting stuff is parameterizing fixtures with PyTest and also how it can be used with Mixer. I have created a separate another uh, calls like uh, search by title function, which leaves with my core. It does simple query, trying to search a book by its title. Uh, I don't think you should explain this line. It's really simple. So I wanted to test this function. The easiest one solution is to test is one line, create a book with some title, check how it works, check that there are some books with this line, and that's it. But what if I wanted to test that uh, my fixture, my actual search by title function, will also find not only exact naming, but also first something, or maybe something then first, how it works like this. Uh, there is not much uh, things to do about this. I have to create multiple book fixtures. I have to do it by my own. Honestly speaking, I can't reuse, just can't the same fixture that was defined a bit above. I have to create multiple of them. So uh, there are several approaches to do that. The first one, I created a helper function. This is not a fixed tool, it's just a helper function that should be called from inside of your test, add books to search. It gets a mixer instance, it gets some search string, and what it does, it uh, inserts some uh, number of books with a certain name inside, some random strings in the beginning and in the end. What I use it, which is also useful and which is related to mixer, it has an ability to use this call, which is called cycle, to create multiple objects at the same time. The blend call should be the same, but cycle gives the ability to create multiple books. At this point, I wanted to create five of them in my database. So at this point, if I call this test debug, I will see in my books table, yeah, here, here are those first, 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 a lot of them are here. I have created them with one call for a mixer. It gets a source string too. Then I can pass this test. I could verify that it passes. It's all green, no, no problem. Uh, the interesting stuff about this test is that I called it uh, separately for the first inside of my books and for the second, or maybe for the any other string I wanted to test my actual search by title function with. The problem with this test suit, what if I wanted to do some cleanup afterwards? Because all those books that were created, here are they, five for the first, five for the second. So when I do this test next time, which is quite a useful situation, I just want to test this again. Oh, it also passed, no problem. I can test it again with debugging. Anyway, this will pass, no problems. But when I go to my books table, there are lots of first and seconds. How could I verify? that must, some code behavior changed and this function actually doesn't work anymore if all those firsts are still sitting in there. 
it could be a trouble, so I have to do some cleanup. I wouldn't suggest you to use this approach. Just to keep in mind, you could, but much better solution is to use PyTest fixtures at this point too. So I have created a bundle of fixtures. One of them is search string, which user will apply to my uh, function. I would say it's first and second. Another one is creating a books to search. At this point, I'm using the same mixer cycle, yielding the books, and then I deleting all of them and doing session commit. Uh, under the hood, mixer uh, applies commit for each blend. So you have, haven't do it manually, as you may notice. Anyway, deleting is, is on your own. That's, your, that's what you have to do manually. And now my test book search looks a bit cleaner. It obtains search string, book search, mixer. Oh, usually, no, it doesn't have to, to be honest. And session to be able to do the search. And I can verify that all books I got from my search are one of those books that I have created by my mixer, or at least uh, those books are in there. I did this test like this because there are still some books in my author table. Let's run test with cleanup uh, just to remove everything from my database to make it more easy for you to understand. Oh, no cleanup. Ah, total cleanup. Yeah, here is it. After this test, my database should be empty. So now running test with cleaning up fixed tours by my uh, mixer. Run you will see that books table remains clear. All five books were deleted. So this test is rather truthful state of things, but I forgot about author. That's the problem with those cleanup fixtures. It happened to create a book. It happened to create an author for each book independently, but it also forgot about removing afterwards. So in case I wanted to do some stuff like cleaning up this, uh, this books, I could also use author fix tool. Then I could use here author is my author. In this case, Mixer will uh, identify that author attribute for my book should be taken from somewhere else, it shouldn't create it by this time. And in this case, I wouldn't add more authors in my author table than it already has. As far as, far as I remember, there was 10. Oh no, something goes wrong. At least I forgot about cleaning up some data. Ah, yeah, it still adds somewhere. Oh yeah, it works, it shouldn't. It doesn't work because I don't do the cleanup here in, in author. Uh, I should probably yield my author. Uh, and in this case, I should create author. Let's do it, yield author. And then if I use my session fixture, I could do session delete my created author and then session commit. So in this case, yeah, I think I still will be able to remain with the same 14 authors in my table. Yeah, it remains clean. So again, the same drawback as I told you about is kind of, it's easy to remain some unexpected things in your database. It's easy to forget to do some cleanup afterwards. So chaining to Mixer, it is a bit easier to create fixtures and do some cleanup afterwards. Another useful technique I wanted to share with you is monkey patching of session object. It works fine with Postgres. What I'm doing here, monkey patch is a PyTest fixture that does monkey patching of some object attributes. What I'm doing here, I'm monkey patching session commit. Now it does flush. There is a huge, huge difference between commit and flush. Uh, commit persist the persist objects in the database uh, and makes it persistent. It says explicitly to the database, all done, keep it as is, as I told you. But if you start in some transaction, 
you can also be able to use flush you can do it flush will persist some table in your database but transactions won't be finished by this you keep uh, working inside of that transaction so actually you could be able to do a rollback afterwards i think it should be done like this like removing going outside of nested transaction i should be able to do a rollback of my session so a monkey patched my session with flush data data will persist uh, at least it will looks like that they are persisted from the python's code but the rollback will clean everything let's see how it works i have the same test published books fixture it works fine let's verify uh, let's run again my total cleanup test just to remove everything okay i hope uh, why it doesn't uh-huh please run okay now i think my author table is empty cool and books table should be also yeah it's clean so let's stop here and run this monkey patched session as you see while creating a fixture i do it as the first example without any mixer at this time anyway i'm in session doing some commit to an author no cleanup nothing goes here when you look at my author object here in my test you could see it object has an id 173 so it looks like object was created and it looks like that object was really persisted on the database more of that my book is this object which is returned by get book function it also persisted in database it was true query to the database and returned an object so it's here but when i look in my table Keep in mind that when I'm using this tool in, in uh, PyCharm, this is a separate session, separate connection to the database. Table is empty. There are no author, no book, nothing is there. It works like this because this code shares the same connection as the same session and the same session ID to the Postgres. Postgres uh, at this point is responsible for holding data i wanted to store in my database uh, kind of in a hanging state they are not 100 percent persistent they are not written down on disk but until transaction is uh, not closed until it's still opened i can either roll back and no data will be persistent nothing will be applied or commit and all change will be applied at this point this keep uh, this is all kept in a separate place in a separate thread uh, you can think it about in uh, such way but anyway uh, there is no way to access this data which were created inside of this transaction outside of this transaction that's why by charm connection any other connection any other tests won't be able to see the data that are persistent inside of this test but here's where i can use it tests runs smoothly without any issues i can clearly see it passes all data coming back but nothing is actually stored this approach may be extremely useful when you want to write write multiple tests running in parallel which do some complicated things do some cleanup and keep in mind you don't have to do any cleanup afterwards any change that uh, coming inside of those published book functions or whatever won't be persistent as you see book was created i was able to get this book but database remains empty no book was really added to it because i did this rollback afterwards that's how it actually works and no commit was actually added the major drawback of this approach is this approach is titled to technology you can easily use it with postgres i believe you can use it with uh, mysql with oracle db and probably many other nice cool database vendors uh, but i'm pretty sure not all of them give you such ability more of that some kind of probably mongodb won't give you such ability for sure or at least you should dive deeper in the technology understand what is the actual level you can do some monkey patching and the second one also major drawback is that code you're working with i mean this publish function 
which gets the session as an argument. This session is not the same as will be will be run in production because this session is monkey patched. What will be do? Uh, well, how could you check if your transactions that are created probably in some published book uh, business function handled properly? If you do this kind of testing using monkey patching, that's a tricky question. I don't have a right answer for that. So this technique may be extremely useful. You can apply it, but keep in mind about its drawbacks too. That's, that's it, folks, about integration testing and decoupling databases using some useful technique. You can apply it for a Python code. Another probably also really useful stuff, uh, I would tell you about the unit testing. I don't have much uh, to tell you about the unit testing itself, but what I want to really tell you about the architectural change that you should introduce in your application to be able to write testable and especially unit testable code. So uh, do you remember I asked you about this publish book function and actually all functions in this core module, all of them know about the actual storage technology. All of them using uh, SQL Alchemy uh, in a direct way. All of them are titled to the way we store data, to the way we persist data. And this is wrong approach because you can't test it in unit test. What you can do at this point, uh, I would say you can create a special storage stuff, class, whatever. It should be an interface that is responsible for storing data. I wrote this uh, abstract base class, but you can avoid it at some point. Anyway, let's concentrate on this actual RDB storage. This class, it's almost the same functions, but this class knows about the actual technology. And what about business functions? Bookstore is one of the business classes which actually does some business job. It's written in, in such way. It gets a storage, which is um, kind of any object that uh, has the same implemented storage interface. And uh, this bookstore store uses this storage interface to persist data but it knows nothing about the actual storage implementation. This bookstore knows nothing about SQL Alchemy, relational database. It knows nothing about that. It knows only about storage and that storage should implement several methods that should be used in my business. This helps us to decouple the code that persists data from the business value code. This is just one function, publish new book. I don't want to add more. Uh, keep it just to keep it simple. This is a business function gives brings me some business value. It has some flow like let's check if some author already persists in my database, in my storage, whatever it is. If it is not persisted, I should create it. Afterwards, I should publish a book again in my storage using this author ID and book's title. At this point, I know nothing about the actual storage implementation. When I run in my code in production, I will pass the example of this RDB storage uh, object as an argument to my bookstore. But from text perspective, tests perspective, I can implement a storage stub realization. It implements the same methods, but it's uh, dummy. It does nothing at this point. I could use uh, mock, I could use unit test, unit test mock object, which will uh, implement the same interface but we'll do nothing or give you mock interfaces for all methods, objects, or whatever. Yeah, so it's under your control. Then in my test suite, I will create the storage tab at this point or my bookstore, which obtains this uh, storage tab as an argument. At this point, I will be able to test my published new book function really using a unit test because nothing will be actually no boundary will be crossed when I call this this method. Everything I, you, I use here is a stub implementation and the actual business flow. At this point, I have full control over this code. Uh, okay, of course it's passed because it does almost nothing. I can create some mock realization. I can probably use some techniques like storage, uh, publish book. Let it be. What's called 
magic mock up import this name here from unit test let it uh, arises as an example our session error at this point it shouldn't work no uh, i did something wrong at this point anyway you have much more control over the actual realization ah yeah it's created here but why it doesn't work publish new book yeah you're right sorry or oh, even more of that uh, search author that I think I should mock because it's a storage. We do the sum search inside of publish new book. Nope, still rocks. Okay. Anyway, you have much more control over this test. This test becomes really, really unit. More of that, you can change this realization. Uh, now it does nothing, but it could be really useful if you use dictionaries for this realization just to store data in your memory and do it as fast as possible using Python without a, without a necess necessity to cross any boundaries with your application and any calls, any methods of your business language. So at this point of view, you have to keep in mind that integration tests is a nice point to start and it's kind of natural to start from integration tests. But I would suggest you to start writing code from unit tests because architecture and how it evolves will be in a lot of ways dictated by the testability of your code. You have to write some uh, interfaces like this storage interface. You have to define some stored book uh, classes just to pass some data to avoid using uh, SQL Alchemy models directly and so on. And this will help you to decouple your code from technologies, from storage and any other stuff you want to use in your code. I think that's it from me. Please ask questions.